start on this computer. Good morning. Well, hello everybody. I hope uh, everyone is excited to start oceanography today. We are going to be uh, taking a tour of the oceans, tour of the oceans, uh, looking at the different ocean basins and their uh, features. Then after we're done with today's lesson, we will once again address the assignments that are due on Wednesday. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to remind everybody that the orientation material is expected by Sunday. I see every a lot of people are coming along with it, so that, that's excellent. Uh, when you complete the uh, practice uh, test for uh, the honor lock, that'll be the biggest relief because that seems to give the students the most problems. Uh, remember, if you get into a situation where it asks you for a password, something's wrong because I do not determine passwords. Honor lock handles all of that. So you just back out and redo it. There's four questions. Uh, if you run into problems, Honor Lock has a website, an FAQ, and a uh, help chat. So again, I'm not an employee of Honor Lock. They've just been hired to the college, uh, by the college, to proctor exams. So uh, they would be who you need to contact first. Obviously, if you need an extension due to computer problems or uh, something along those lines, that is something that you'll need to contact me about. But uh, getting Honor Lock installed and your computer up and running, uh, that's something that I can't really help you with except uh, to give you an extension if, say, you need a new computer or your webcam's not uh, working or uh, whatever issues there may be. So that Honor Lock, you should probably handle first just to get that out of the way. Uh, we've already gone through the syllabus, so it's easy to uh, knock that syllabus quiz off and send me the email uh, saying that you understand the late policies and things like that. Uh, that's, that's all easy. So we are going to move into our first lesson. And we're going to look at a tour of the oceans and general uh, cartography. Uh, charts, an ocean chart is the same as a, a land map, except it's a map of the ocean, they call them charts. Uh, so a, a ship would have the chart room and work with uh, various tools like the dividers, the compass, uh, the parallel rulers, things uh, along those lines to navigate through our oceans. So cartography and charts are analogous to a map on land. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, the, the ocean and the different basins and some of the uh, high points of, of the ocean. So hopefully everyone, uh, sees the, the PowerPoint now. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yep, I got it. Yes. Good, good, we're good. Uh, so we're gonna move on to the geography of the Atlantic Ocean first. And this is the one really that we'll uh, focus on more than the Pacific and the, the Indian, the Arctic. And uh, the Arctic is basically under ice. And then the Southern Ocean, which are our main ocean basins. We're gonna really focus more on the, uh, our area, the Atlantic, the North Atlantic, the Gulf. Uh, you can see here, this is a uh, physiographic chart uh, of, of the ocean. Uh, running through the ocean where my cursor's running, that is the mid-ocean ridge. And then you have a ridge line here. You also have some ridge lines here. The ocean basically has what we call oceanic ridges through them. Uh, those ridges are active faults. 
Okay, so the ocean floor is changing. Usually an oceanic ridge is where new ocean floor is created and it separates. And then you have these continental margins where uh, the ocean floor subducts. We're gonna get into plate tectonics of the ocean floor a little later. Uh, the ocean floor is mainly made of a higher density rock than our continents are. So they sit lower and the continents sit higher on the mantle. Uh, higher density means they're slightly heavier. The rocks are referred to as basaltic. Now basalt is a type of rock and there's other rocks related to basalt and those are the type of rocks that the ocean floor is made out of. They're a little lower in quartz and higher in a mineral content, so they're darker. And so, and they're a little heavier because of those uh, metallic type minerals, darker and heavier. Our continental rocks are a little lighter colored, like sand is a little lighter colored. Uh, they have more quartz in them and they're referred to as granitic rocks, like granite. But there's other rocks related to granite with a high quartz content which makes them sit a little higher, makes them a little uh, less dense. So the ocean floor, its composition is uh, much different from our continent's composition. Uh, so that there's the mid-ocean ridge. Iceland is up here, Iceland. That is an area of the mid-ocean ridge. So it's a ridge, it's an active spreading center, uh, basaltic island. And uh, it's volcanic because it's oceanic ridge. It just happens to be above sea level. Bermuda, down here, we'll learn a little bit about that. That's on a, a little rise. We'll, we'll learn about that. And Cape Hatteras and the outer banks of the Carolinas are um, of oceanic importance. We'll address our Gulf Coast, of course. Uh, the Caribbean Sea, Caribbean Sea, right here, F. That as you'll learn, is one of those subduction areas where an ocean plate is sliding under an ocean plate. Ocean spreading creates ocean crust. Subduction, where you have ocean being pushed under another ocean, that destroys ocean crust and they balance each other out. Uh, subduction creates volcanic islands, which the Caribbean island, uh, island arc is. So uh, we'll be learning about the formation of the Caribbean, what a sea is, uh, and the different types of rocks in the first part of the course. The Mediterranean Sea is here. Notice Africa and Europe almost touch. That's called the Straits of Gibraltar. And they are really close. You can visually see across them. They're that close. Restricts flow. The Mediterranean Sea is an isolated uh, evaporation basin, which is uh, hypersaline, more salinity than the ocean because it's cut off from general ocean flow. And then in the Southern Hemisphere, there's a couple of uh, Trinidad Islands. In the Southern Hemisphere, these seamounts, and we're going to learn what a seamount is and use that as an example for map reading and for uh, you know, seamounts and, and things. I have someone trying to get into class. I'm not sure yeah, what their name is. They have one of those, uh, not, a, not a name. <laughs> it's not this person or this person. I don't know who it is, but I'll admit them. Okay, so let's take a look at our first stop on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is Iceland. You can see Iceland here is a shield volcano. Shield volcanoes are made of basalt. They come up from the ocean floor, so they're really big. That basalt flows out, so they're not as steep walled, but this all is basalt. This is a fissure volcano, 
There's the ocean ridge, that spread center, that crack right there. That's where the lava is coming from. Uh, that is what we call a divergent or spreading apart boundary. So the mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic Ocean is divergent and spreading apart. Iceland is a giant shield volcano made of fissure, fissure, which means cracks, fissures. And that flow is what creates the island of Iceland. Now, uh, people live, live on Iceland and they get the bulk of their energy geothermal because it's handy, it's right there. So uh, that's one of the perks of Iceland, I, I guess, is uh, real cheap energy, uh, geothermal energy. Of course, uh, there's some negatives as well, but that's all fresh basaltic shield volcano created by a divergent spreading boundary. Now, the next tour is because we looked at the large map is the Bermuda rise, Bermuda. Bermuda, set of islands here. Notice the Gulf Stream. Then you have the Azores Current, the Canary Current, the North Equatorial Current, Antilles, Gulf Stream. It forms a circle. It also breaks off cuts through the Gulf and forms a circle. You don't see it quite on this map, but we're gonna learn about that loop current as well. Oceans have circular currents. All the ocean basins, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North Pacific, South Pacific, Indian Ocean, they all have a current loop in them. That current loop is called a gyra, G-Y-R-E. That is a loop of currents. Large scale, they're, they're geostrophic, they cover the globe, these currents. Uh, they're surface currents, they're driven by global winds. Sargassum is called golf weed. You know, after a storm, you can walk the beaches here and it's littered with seaweed and that's what sargassum is. So our North Atlantic gyra has got the nickname Sargasso Sea because it has these few huge floating mats of algae. And the old explorers uh, with the wind sailed vessels would get caught in these tangled mats of algae, uh, big mats of seaweed. So it was called the Sargasso Sea for that reason, because the algae is called sargassum. Uh, so that's how that got its nickname. So you can see the term Sargasso Sea. Now, a sea is any partially isolated body of water in the ocean. So the Mediterranean Sea, as we mentioned in that image, is very isolated, it's a sea. The Caribbean Sea is isolated by those volcanic islands, so it's a sea. The Sargasso Sea is isolated by that current. So it's called the Sargasso Sea, although it's really a gyra, it's not a C in the traditional uh, sense. So the Bermuda rise is a rise in the ocean floor. Okay, so it's a little a rise. Now rises in the ocean floor are good because those currents get pushed up, causing upwelling. Upwelling draws nutrients to the surface. Cool water holds nutrients well. So these upwelling areas are productive. You can see it's getting warm water from the Gulf. Although it's fairly high in latitude, it's the northernmost northern coral reefs. Now there's all different species of coral. Uh, reef building coral, reef building coral uh, has symbiotic algae living in its tissue. So it needs warm, clear water. Other corals, which aren't reef building, can live in cold water. So, you know, people say the coral reefs are going extinct. Uh, global warming's impacting them, pollution, uh, which is true because they're bleaching because of high temperatures and their habitat's changing. They're very environmentally sensitive, whereas non reef building coral are a lot hardier. We get them living up here in the Gulf and, and further, but that's the northernmost uh, 
area where reef building coral can live. And it lives because the Gulf Stream is a warm water pump. So uh, that's just uh, the, the uh, Bermuda. Now, Bermuda was an old, you can see down here, these old uh, fellas with those uh, groovy shorts. Groovy, did I just date myself? The really cool board shorts, but they're not. They're called Bermuda shorts. Uh, they used to have a dress code and they were very conservative. So they wore the jackets. And then because it was the island life, they got out of the trousers and got to wear those super long shorts. But there was the dress code on Bermuda. So Bermuda is famous for Bermuda shorts, which kind of look ridiculous in my opinion. But there you have it. That's Bermuda shorts because it was a resort colony back in the days. Uh, but it's part of the platform. So it's elevated from the sea bottom and they get warm water and upwelling in the Bermuda area. It's a hot spot. That's what caused the upwelling. Uh, it's a hot spot. And we'll learn about hot spots when we talk about plate tectonics. Speaking of the Gulf Stream, now I'll go back for a second. You see how this Gulf Stream's getting curves out right here? Right there, it curves out, follows the contour of the United States and gets pushed out to sea right here at that point where my cursor is. That point is Cape Hatteras and the Outer Banks. You can see the Gulf Stream, this warm current getting pushed right out to sea. It's mixing with the colder water in the north, not very well because warm and cold water doesn't mix. You can see little eddies, whirlpools swirling around this area, a lot of storms. Hurricane tracks curve up, get pushed out to sea. So Cape Hatteras is where the Gulf Stream gets pushed out and a lot of hurricanes get pushed out. That's why Carolina's hockey team's called the hurricane. Uh, the Gulf Stream gets pushed out to sea at Cape Hatteras. There's the point, outer banks of North Carolina. A lot of storms. Now. In the winter, storms get pushed down the coast by another cooler current up here called the Labrador Current. So in nor'easter are those winter storms that follow the Labrador Current and get pushed out to sea by the Gulf Stream. The nor'easters you hear about in the news. Uh, so the Gulf Stream is a warm current, part of the North Atlantic Gyra gets steered out to sea at Cape Hatteras. You can follow the contours. Blows by, literally blows current, blowing by uh, Bermuda, giving it its coral reefs and its warm climate. And that is the whole ocean system on the East Coast of uh, North America. When winter subsides, you get meltwater, that meltwater is pushing down from the north. That's called the Labrador Current, stronger in the spring, a little bit weaker year out. It's always doing battle with the Gulf Stream, causing turbulent weather. Hurricanes that form on these warm equatorial currents ride the Gulf Stream or get steered in by the loop current or the Gulf Stream. So they take that into the Gulf and then moving up like the loop current or catch the Gulf Stream, and they make that big wide turn that we're all familiar with here in Florida. Uh, that's due to our interaction between the global winds, the trade winds and the westerlies, and our ocean currents, the Gulf Stream and loop current hook up. So uh, I know it's the first class, and I wouldn't expect you to know everything, but we're learning these connections and Hopefully they make sense, uh, okay? Now on our coast, the Gulf Coast, we do have a loop current that comes in and around. Uh, here is the Florida platform. The Florida platform, here's sea level. So we're shallow out to the middle grounds and then we're deep. Uh, Florida is about two thirds larger than the exposed land is today. Sea level rises and falls with climate. We've all heard of climate change, I'm sure, but natural climate change is a little bit different. 
uh, related, but a little different. We, the earth goes through periods of glacial and interglacial periods, which means sea level naturally rises and falls. When the sea ice grows on land, sea level drops. When the ice melts off the land, sea level rises. So the Florida platform is all of Florida, the part that's underwater currently, and the part that's above water. You can see how wide that Florida platform is. During ice ages, when there's a lot of ice, uh, Florida's larger. We'd be central state even. During uh, periods of interglacials, the sea level varies. So Florida is basically layers of limestone and evaporite. Limestone evaporate, limestone evaporate, coral reef evaporites. Uh, it's layers of underwater, not underwater, underwater, not underwater when you drill down into our um, rock. And then our basement, the basement of Florida is uh, African in origin. When the Pangea was together, Africa and North America, and then the split. So uh, Florida's got an interesting geology. West coast, very, look how shallow it is. We don't get waves. Waves break at depth. Uh, so the longer the wavelength, deeper the water. Our water is very shallow, so we only get short wavelengths, which means when they break, they, they're, they're teeny. We don't get big waves on the west coast of Florida unless you go out sometimes hundreds of miles out to the middle grounds where you have your continental slope and your abyssal floor or deep ocean. So Florida is about a third of its potential land right now. Uh, we mentioned uh, the Mediterranean Sea in our little tour. Now the uh, Mediterranean Sea is a uh, a Mediterranean Sea is basically a uh, coastal sea isolated by land. Now, the Mediterranean Sea is the most famous Mediterranean Sea. Very, very uh, isolated because the Straits of Gibraltar have closed. Uh, they're still closing. The Mediterranean Sea will be a giant lake centuries from now, but not in our lives. Uh, it's a concentration basin at present because evaporation exceeds precipitation. There are places where precipitation, like Tampa Bay, is a dilution basin, slightly less salty than the surrounding Gulf because we get runoff from land, Hillsborough River, our springs empty into it. And so Tampa Bay is a slight dilution basin. Dilution basins have a little lower salinity. Concentration basins have a higher salinity. Speaking of our Gulf, you can see there's our Florida platform, how large it is. And then here's a little more platform that's been carved by the Gulf Stream, so it's still pretty deep. And then you have your steep drop off. So the Florida platform is, is, is huge. Here's Yucatan, a lot of that's underwater. So when you go to Cancun, there's a lot of sinkholes, very similar topography. Loop current comes in, loops around, exits, rejoins the Gulf Stream. So we are ninth largest body of the world, uh, body of water. We are definitely a sea. We have input from the ocean, but it's isolated. And uh, we have a wide Florida platform. We have our own current called the loop current. We do get over 3,000 feet deep. Not the deepest part of the ocean, but it's still pretty deep out here. In But it's, it's far from land. No real big waves on the West Coast because Look how shallow it is from hundreds of miles out. Bigger waves on the East Coast because it's deeper. 
huge waves because you go right down in places like Australia and uh, Hawaii, uh, you go right to the deep ocean, right offshore, you get the biggest, biggest waves. So the deeper the water is, the larger the waves. Now, looking at the Caribbean Sea, here's your island arc. Remember, I said it was subduction, which means one plate sliding under another, causing uplift and down. Uh, these volcanic islands are all result of that down push, down push. Uh, the Puerto Rican trench is that seam where it's being pushed down. That is the deepest point in the Atlantic Ocean, these trenches, these areas of subduction. Uh, they are susceptible to earthquakes because it's an active plate boundary and volcanism. When you look back at ours here, very quiet. You don't get a lot of earthquakes, and volcanoes around us. We don't have a active plate margin. Uh, wide continental shelf and a lot of deposition means no real plate margin. Shallow or very deep, no continental shelf, super deep, and volcanoes mean active plate margin. So the Caribbean in our neighborhood is the area where there's the most tectonic activity. Uh, now the Mediterranean Sea, like we said there, it's only 14 kilometers wide, and then it's very isolated. The Black Sea formed uh, at the end of last ice age. So uh, that's a fairly new body of water. It used to be connected uh, better. Sea levels uh, dropped, isolating the Black Sea. Mediterranean Sea, which is further being isolated by plate tectonics. The reason it's so blue is because it's partially isolated. So it's nutrient poor. So there's not a lot of plankton. Right near the coasts, there's life, yes. But in the middle of the uh, Mediterranean, in the middle of most oceans, actually, uh, there's less life. So the Mediterranean is very, very blue because there's not a lot of active plankton because it's a nutrient poor area. Now in the Southern hemisphere, we just include that because uh, when we learn about latitude and longitude, I'm gonna say, where's the Trinidad Seamounts? Look in the Southern hemisphere and you'll have an S instead of an N in your latitude and longitude uh, readings. But the uh, Trinidad Seamounts, a seamount is an extinct underwater volcano, usually coming from the spreading center of the mid-ocean ridge. And as it gets farther away, the volcanoes aren't formed anymore because it's not on the active hotspot and they wear down and they're called seamounts. So seamounts are extinct volcanoes that are under the ocean. But because they're a little shallower, they have areas of upwelling where nutrients get pushed up. So pelagic fish and other ocean life, pelagic means over the deep, pelagic fish live there and move from seamount to seamount and ride these ocean currents. Uh, pelagic fish are very commercially desirable. Okay, they're the big, the big uh, billfish, the mahi. Uh, they live out in deeper water. You don't really find them hanging out in Tampa Bay. It's too shallow, too nutrient rich. You know, they need the big, colder, deeper water. Uh, wahoo, things like that. And they tend to hang out near currents or uh, these pelagic uh, islands and seamounts. So these are important ecologically for pelagic fish and migratory species. So archipelagos are island arcs, generally volcanic. Because they're volcanic, they're caused by plate tectonics, so they have deeper water around them. And they're important for pelagic ocean organisms. So that's just a survey. We'll run back up top. That's just a survey of some of the hot spots in the Atlantic Ocean. 
Uh, we could talk whole class, whole class again, all over on more hot spots of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but we're just going to talk about some of the major uh, points of interest in each ocean. Now, here is the physiographic chart of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I traced off, here's your spreading centers, and then all this is subduction, and it makes a huge loop or ring, and that's called the ring of fire. Everyone's heard the term ring of fire, I'm sure. That is where 70% or so of active earthquake, volcanoes, other uh, geologic disturbances occur. So this is an active plate boundary. It's being pushed up in this direction a little bit. There's your spreading. Here's your subduction. So the Pacific plate is moving up and being slid under here. All of here is your archipelagos. You can see archipelagos. Here is your spreading center. And uh, so it's a very tectonically active continental margin. Because it's tectonically active, you don't have much of a continental shelf. It's so different from the Atlantic, which has wide continental shelves, huge thick deposits of sediment. The uh, west coast of America and the Pacific Ocean has very narrow continental shelves, deep water nearby, which means big waves, uh, a lot of cliffs, a lot of trenches, deep, deep ocean, not many beaches, far less beaches. Uh, so very different coasts. Uh, the Pacific Rise and Ridge are the ocean ridge system that runs through the Pacific, seafloor spreading. Uh, moving up here, this is the Great Barrier Reef. Because it's a reef, it's partially isolating the body and the sea associated with it. It's called the Coral Sea. Very diverse. Uh, Marianas Trench, the deepest point is the Challenger Deep, which is part of Marianas Trench. It was discovered by the Challenger. That's how it got its name, the Challenger Deep in Marianas Trench. Uh, Japan is a volcanic island arc caused by subduction. The Emperor's Seamounts, the Emperor's Seamounts, you can, uh, they're old extinct volcanoes. We use these seamounts to chart ocean floor movement through the ages. Aleutians, archipelagos associated with the uh, Pacific Plate sliding under the uh, North American plate up here. That's uh, a volcanic island arc off of Alaska. The Bering Straits, uh, in the Bering Straits, you see those cool TV programs about the people that catch the big crabs. And they're always in the Bering Sea. And that's because cold water holds nutrients and oxygen better than warm water. So these giant crabs, the king crabs, and other organisms uh, like this nutrient rich water. So they're very productive waters. And that's why the productive cold waters are where these commercial harvests are important. Hawaii is formed from a hot spot. A uh, hot spot is an upwelling in the mantle. From this mantle convection, we discussed uh, a little bit about. Uh, that drives the plate tectonics, the mantle. Hawaii is where it, it burned through. San Andreas Fault, the famous fault here. The Galapagos Islands, right here up Ecuador. The trade winds are pushing Ecuador's trees when they fall in off of storms to the Galapagos. Theoretically, that's how those tortoises and marine iguanas and these unique Darwin's finches were all found in the Galapagos because it's at the convergence of a cold current coming from the south. They even have penguins in the Galapagos. A warm current coming from the north and the equator, getting the trade winds moving in this direction. So the Galapagos is a convergence of three environmental variables 
making it one of the most unique places on earth. Ecotourism is one of their main uh, mainstays because they have these really cool, weird creatures that exist nowhere else on earth because of the unique environment. The Andes, the Andes is analogous to an archipelago, a volcanic island chain. It's a continental island chain because the subduction here is pushing under the South American plate causing coastal uplift. So these are huge volcanic mountains on a continent. Our hemisphere, the Western hemisphere, the Andes is the most extensive mountain range and it's formed by ocean plate tectonics. And then uh, off the coast of the Andes, you have your trench because all subduction areas have a trench. And that trench is uh, the Peru-Chile trench. All right, so running through our East Pacific rise, it's a divergent spreading center. Remember, divergent, just like in the uh, Atlantic, it's a divergent. I'd like to point out to you right here, there's your Caribbean island arc, and that's a little subduction. This little plate that splintered off is sliding under the Atlantic plate, causing this uplift and trenches. So we have our little island arc here. Here you have subduction where the plate is sliding under. And because it's sliding under, you have your coastal Andes mountains, which are also volcanic. And this little broken off plate is subducting. Here you have the Pacific plate moving in this direction. There's your San Andreas Fault. So it's sliding laterally at the San Andreas Fault, running right through California. That's America's most famous fault. Uh, it's part of the Pacific plate sliding by the North American plate. So this is the mechanics of the Pacific off the coast of North America. Now, these ridge systems have what we call black smokers. They are undersea volcanoes putting out. Now, it's not really smoke, but it's analogous to smoke. It's um, hydrogen sulfide and other chemicals are spewing from them. And it's very, uh, it's dark, there's no light because it's below the photic zone. But this hydrogen sulfide is energy rich. And organisms like these giant tube worms, these are six, eight foot worms, they chemosynthesize, much like plants photosynthesize, turn light into food. They chemosynthesize, turning the hydrogen sulfide into food. And entire ocean food chains never see light, are dependent on this hydrogen sulfide spewing out of these hydrothermal vents. And the trees are not plant, they're giant worms. So that's Dr. Seuss almost, giant worm trees, it's reality. Uh, so here's your forest of Rifta, that's their genus, giant worm trees with these red plumes. Those red plumes contain chemosynthetic bacteria, and they are converting these chemicals to food, and entire ecosystems live in the forest of worms. So that's kind of crazy. That uh, is found at all these deep sea vents uh, in some way, shape, or form. Life is taking hold everywhere. So, uh, and these deep sea areas are, are uh, famous for light without, uh, life without sunlight. We did mention the Great Barrier Reef and the interior sea, which is called the Coral Sea. The Coral Sea is considered the rainforest of the ocean. What does that mean? Very diverse, okay? So the greatest diversity in the ocean in the smallest area is the Great Barrier Reef and the Coral Sea that is formed from it. We 
mentioned Mariana Trench, the deepest point in the ocean. This illustration is beautiful to show you what subduction is. We have one plate sliding under another plate, forming a trench, forming volcanic islands from the uplift. Trenches are the deepest points in the ocean. Challenger Deep is the deepest point. Challenger Deep right here on the Mariana Trench. Here's your volcanic island arc. Here's your trench following it. There's your subduction. This specific plate here is melting and reforming a tennosphere, which is the upper zone of the mantle. New crust is created at ocean ridge systems. So oceans, the ocean floor is like a great conveyor belt. Creation at upwelling or uh, uh, at spread centers, dives under at um, subduction zones. Another subduction zone. Here, look, you have uplift and subduction is your Japan Island Arc, Sea of Japan behind it, trench here, and volcanic island arc here. So Japan is a classic, one of the most, if not the most seismically active areas on Earth, a classic volcanic island arc formed by subduction. More seamounts, the Emperor seamounts, and then the Hawaiian seamounts. You can see how the Pacific plate was moving north and then shifted directions to north, uh, northwest. And you can see seamounts. You can trace the ocean movement. You can measure the distance from the current hotspot and extrapolate how fast it's moving <clears throat> by the age of the rocks and the distance covered. So these, and these seamounts are also important, remember, for pelagic species, this is a far trek. How do you get to Hawaii if you're a pelagic fish? You follow the highway. You have food all along the way because shallow water, nutrient rich. So this is your migration highway to Hawaii from the colder and then your uh, North Pacific rim here, Japan, things like that. Pelagic fish, turtles and such follow that migratory route. Bering Straits, yeah, the word was right there and then it wasn't. Here's your Aleutian Islands, more subduction going on. Your island arc. Pacific plate. Here's your illusions, a little closer up. Notice they're covered in snow. It's Alaska for heaven's sakes. Subduction. Subduction is pushing the Pacific plate under, causing this uplift. You have a trench out to sea here. So this is the northern arc of the Ring of Fire. The Bering Straits right here, here's two islands in the Bering Straits, America and Russia are several miles apart, and that's it. Here's, now when sea level was lower during an ice age, this was a land and ice bridge. The original Americans, based on fossil evidence, walked across this and moved down following the California current. California current's a cold water current, Nutrient rich because it's cold water, a lot of food. So the original Homo sapiens, the first Americans in, uh, in America, crossed over here and followed that current down with food, for food too. Uh, so here, the Bering Straits. It is of the, the fame of the, uh, the great fishing, uh, the, the crabbing shows and stuff because uh, of the nutrient rich cold water. Now, warm water in the middle of our Pacific plate is Hawaii. There's your shield volcano, not very steep, huge. Lava coming up. Now, you don't see lava on granitic continental volcanoes. Uh, those explode. Lava is only found on basaltic volcanoes as far as bubbling, 
melted rock. This is all rich in the metals. Metals melt at high temperatures. Quartz, quartz uh, does not make a nice viscous flowing lava. They tend to explode like um, Pompeii. Pompeii, you know how it exploded, sent hot ash, and all those uh, people were vaporized and replaced by minerals, and the, 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 uh, the molds are now on display as the uh, people of Pompeii. That was an explosive volcano. And Krakatoa, an explosive volcano. Mount St. Helens in my lifetime, an explosive volcano. Uh, those are more quartz-rich, continental origin volcanoes that explode. The Iceland and Hawaii, you can see here, they're not as explosive. They have flowing lava, and they create these huge, huge volcanoes called shield volcanoes and gigantic islands. So they're larger volcanoes, and they erupt for a long time but they're not as violent. There's our San Andreas Fault. Now, we, we looked at that. That's a lateral fault. There's no subduction, no spreading. It's moving side to side. The Pacific Plate sliding by the North American Plate. Uh, that's why California has so many earthquakes, because it's a slow slide, just moves a little bit. Pressure builds up, moves a little bit. It's very slow paced, but they get constant tremors. Occasionally, the catch lasts for a couple of years and then releases a bigger shot of energy. And that's when you have larger earthquakes in California. But, you know, it's just one plate sliding by another plate in the case of the San Andreas Fault. So California is not going to fall into the ocean the way we were told when I was young. Uh, the big one, the big one, now it's, it's a constant slow slide that when it catches, it takes a few years for pressure to build up, moves a little bit, you get the tremors, moves a little bit more, you get a stronger earthquake. Now, the Galapagos, which were made famous by Charles Darwin, uh, because uh, Darwin was a, a naturalist and uh, a barnacle, barnacle specialist. He was floundering uh, until he got the job on the uh, HMS Beagle, which was uh, commissioned to go around the world. And he was hired as the ship's naturalist to study uh, life, you know, study chart, collect. They collected all these specimens and stuff. So Darwin was the ship's naturalist. They were out to sea for a few years. Uh, he was postulating his theories of evolution on this trip, and the Galapagos played a key role because of its endemic species, island isolation, and over time they evolved into their own species, but close correlation to the coastal species. So really the Galapagos Islands were uh, the linchpin in his origin of the species theories. So the Galapagos is famous because of that. It's named after the saddle-backed tortoises. Galapagos means saddle back. So the saddle-backed tortoises are how the Galapagos got its name. Andes, Andes are those coastal volcanic mountains that we touched upon, caused by subduction, a splinter of the Pacific plate caused the Nazca plate is being pushed under the South American plate, causing uplift. Giant trench, the Peru Chile trench runs off, off the coast. I have them out of order, so I should and will. There we go. The Peru Chile trench is off the coast, subducting. So here's your ring of fire spreading center here. This is just subduction highlighted. So it's like the horseshoe of subduction. And then the ring is closed by your spreading. So your Pacific plate is moving in this direction. Here's your San Andreas Fault sliding by. Uh, and that's the layout of the Pacific Ocean. 
the largest feature on our planet is the Pacific Ocean Basin. Although it's still getting smaller, it's still by far the largest feature on our planet. The third major ocean basin, we have two minors, the Southern Ocean and Arctic. The, the third major is the Indian. The Indian shrinking. It was part of a much larger system called the Tethyus Ocean back when there was a Pangaea. But due to plate movement, it has gotten squeezed. So it's a lot smaller than the others. There are some highlights. We'll start up here in Russia where we have a inland lake that's forming because Asia is splitting and there's a rift right there. That's Lake Bacal. We'll mention it because it's the only lake large enough to have tides and it contains the bulk of the world's fresh water. It's a huge, deep ocean rift, uh, uh, sorry, rift. Black Sea we mentioned earlier, so we'll, we'll touch upon that. And the Caspian Sea is a concentration basin that is now cut off. It is no longer a sea. It is now a lake, and it is the world's largest lake. It's a remnant of the ocean. The Red Sea, which is kind of a right here, it's another rift, but it's in the ocean. So that's our next ocean. It's an embryonic stage ocean starting to form due to plate tectonics. Himalayas, highest place on Earth due to plate tectonics. The Seychelles, the only granitic islands in the world. Madagascar is a huge island off the coast of Africa. Prince Edward Island, another Southern Hemisphere island, uh, included that for its uh, stories uh, that, uh, that we'll get to. Then, then the Indian Rise, Subduction, Java Trench, or sorry, Indian Rise, Divergence, Southern Java Trench, Convergence. So those are some of the highlights of the Indian Ocean and Asia. So we mentioned Lake Bacal. It's a rift, meaning it's being pulled apart. It contains 20% of the world's fresh water. So the bulk of the world's fresh water, one lake. 20% is a huge uh, amount in one lake. And uh, because it's isolated, it contains mostly endemic species found nowhere else in the world. It has the uh, only freshwater seals. It's large enough to have tides. And uh, it's very, very uh, unique in Siberia. Now, the Black Sea formed. The Black Sea formed. It was a lake, and it got connected, formed. Uh, end of the Ice Age, during global sea level rise. And uh, it was a flood of uh, epic proportion. Many scholars believe it was the flood discussed in the biblical account of Noah uh, because it happened at the same time period in the same area. And most of that civilization was wiped out by the sudden flood when this gorge collapsed and formed the Black Sea. Uh, so many scholars believe that that is the account of the formation of the Black Sea. It's just a tidbit of interest, uh, putting one culture into the next and kind of taking a look at it geologically. The Caspian Sea was connected, was connected. Now it's not. It's shrinking due to evaporation. It is very salty and it is the largest lake in the world. The Red Sea is a ocean rift. You can see it's getting pulled apart. Kind of great picture here, because just like Lake Bacal, except it connects the Indian Ocean with the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the Sinai Peninsula being ripped off, much like Florida was ripped when we separated from Africa. It looks like it's going to stick here with Asia and not Africa. You can also see the Nile River. And really, the only green around this desert is because of the Nile River. And there's the Nile River Delta, longest river in the world. The Blue Nile, the White Nile, and then the Nile itself running into the Mediterranean Sea 
here's where ancient Egypt was on this little fertile plain. So uh, you can see a lot of history and a lot of Earth's future right here with the ocean ridge forming, the Sinai Peninsula being split, and seafloor spreading, uh, taking hold, and Africa moving away from Asia. The Himalayas are convergence, land to land, highest mountain range in the planet formed by convergent plate tectonics. The Seychelles Islands are the only granitic islands in the world, and that means they weren't formed by volcanoes. Remember, ocean volcanoes are basaltic, so they are formed by plate tectonics splitting them off of land. So they're very unique because of that. Madagascar, stupidest movie in the world. One of the larger islands off the coast of Africa. It is basaltic, it's endemic, and it's among the oldest islands in the world. It dates back to Pangaea uh, and one of the splits when uh, that occurred. So it's over 65 million years old. Now, the Prince Edward Islands, uh, this is one of those truth is stranger than fiction. It's a small, small uh, chain of islands that were uninhabited in uh, the Indian Ocean down near the Arctic Circle, uh, Antarctic Circle, I should say. Uh, and they were used for weather stations. And because they were, uh, there was rats and mice that came with people. And then, so people brought cats. Five, to be exact. These five cats reproduced to be nearly 3,500 cats, and they started killing all the unique birds there. So they hired people to come kill all the cats. Uh, so uh, they were infected with a the disease. They, they, they released the disease, and not all the cats died, and the cats that lived were super cats, disease-resistant. So they had to hire in cat bounty hunters to come and, and get rid of all the cats to save the birds. So now they have no cats, still have mice, and a lot less birds. Kind of a weird, creepy story about how people screw things up, but truth is stranger than, stranger than fiction. Sorry, cat lovers, but uh, that's what happened on Prince Edward Island in the uh, South Indian Ocean. The Mid-Indian Ridge, just like any other good ocean, has a spread center. And here is your trench, the Java Trench associated with the subduction. There is your island arc. This Java Trench is home to some of the most dangerous tsunamis in the world because the what happens is there's millions of people living here in Indonesia. And it's really close to the spread center or the subduction where you have your waves hit from these earthquakes. When you go back here, so here's the earthquake zone. Waves destroy this area, but it takes hours to cross the ocean, so everyone here has time to evacuate. But this is one of the big danger tsunami areas right here uh, off the Java Trench. Now, ocean charts, chartog cartography, is what we're going to wrap today up with. All, all of the uh, charts, the old charts, when uh, we first uh, started to become seafarers, at least in Mediterranean culture, were housed at the Library of Alexandria, the great library. Uh, things like, and this one example, Eratosthenes, he uh, developed latitude and longitude. He also calculated the circumference of Earth using shadow angles, and he was accurate, by the way. And all of this information from Greco-Roman culture and Mediterranean seafarers and all the charts were housed at the library, and the library burned down and set America, or not set America, set the world back uh, centuries through Europe into the Dark Ages, stopped scientific progress in its track, uh, for generations. 
all this knowledge was lost and we're still piecing together what they had. But latitude and longitude, like we mentioned, was first uh, introduced by uh, Eratosthenes, uh, how we locate areas on Earth. Latitude is north or south of the equator. The equator is zero, maximum 90 north or 90 south. Longitude is zero is a randomly mutually agreed upon point running through Greenwich, England. That's how we measure time from mean Greenwich time because every 15 degrees is one hour. Earth turns 15 degrees per hour. So our time zones are approximately 15 degrees in longitude. Notice lines get close together near the poles, far apart near the equators. So longitude you cannot use to measure distance. Only time, 15 degrees per hour. Latitude, you can measure distance because they're parallel, so they're all the same distance apart. So latitude and longitude is like a grid system. The grid system is used to locate places on Earth. When you read this grid, you have to put north or south for latitude, east or west for longitude, and the reference prime meridian for east and west equator for north and south. Polaris is the North Star. The North Star is located above the North Pole. So it is a fixed point in space, the North Star. It's not the brightest star, but it's a fixed point over the North Pole and it's used to find latitude. You can use it for navigation because it's a fixed point. The study of depth comes from bathymetric studies. Uh, back in the old days, our bathymetric maps were done by plumb bobbing. Now they're done by uh, outer space. You can use uh, space satellites to measure your ocean depth. But sonar is the most common. You can buy a sonar rig for a fishing boat and map the ocean floor uh, around you. It's very accurate. So here's a bathymetric map of west coast of Florida. You can see how shallow it is. And then the lines are close together. That's your continental slope down to your deep ocean where you are gentle again. So oceans generally have a continental province, a steep slope, and then a deep area called the abyss. The continental province is part of the continents, so it's granitic in nature. The ocean floor is basaltic in nature, and then the slope is the drop-off or transition from one to the other. So continents, what I'm saying is continents don't end where the land ends, they end where the shelf ends. Wide shelf east coast, no shelf west coast. Contour lines connect equal points of depth. NOAA, NOAA has an office of coastal survey and they are responsible for drawing charts of all navigable waters. So these nautical charts show the nature, the depth, the sea bottom configuration, Dangers, tides, man-made like day markers, buoys, and then magnetic field, Earth's magnetic field. So a nautical chart contains all that information. Uh, we use them for transportation, engineering, Navy, and for us, recreation. You can go buy a chart at any local fishing store. They'll even have the best places to fish marked and what species are you'll tend to find there. So everything's charted that's called navigable, but for us, our territory, United States, 12 nautical miles offshore is us. That's still America. So that's our waters. 
out to 200 nautical miles is our economic. So we own all the resources 200 nautical miles from the coast. And then international water starts here. So you ever see those uh, gambling boats? They go out past this 12 nautical miles and then you're in a zone that's, uh, the laws are a little more fuzzy. So uh, more goes out here and, and then economic zone, these are international waters, but they're owned by us, uh, all the resources. And then the law of the sea applies 200 nautical miles out. So you can't empty your ballast here. You can empty it. You can't empty it here. What that means is um, ships have a ballast. Big ships, you know, they take in seawater, makes them a little heavier so they can sink a little bit and travel through the water smoother and then saves energy. When you empty your ballast, makes your ship rise higher because it's lighter, takes more energy to push it because you're fighting the wind and the waves and, and you don't plow through. So what happens is these ships want to conserve energy so they keep a little bit of water in their ballast until they get a little closer and then empty it. Well, larval fish, plankton, uh, just a lot of things are in ship water ballast because they pump it directly from seawater and it's how uh, a lot of environmental uh, catastrophes have happened, like the zebra mussels, things like that, transported by ship's ballast. So it's illegal to dump your ballast inside of economic zones. So we're charting, even the Great Lakes are charted because they're navigable and they are, the St. Lawrence Seaway connects them. Uh, nautical miles, which are different from land miles, are what our charts usually use. You've heard the term knots, that's wind speed, that's also done in nautical miles per hour. Statute miles land. Fathom is six feet, that's a, a traditional depth. And then meters, you know all about meters, that's the metric system. So a nautical mile is a little bit longer than a statute mile, it's 1.15 miles, but it's based on one minute, 1 60th of a degree, of latitude. So one degree latitude, 60 nautical miles. So it's very um, easy to measure nautical miles on a chart. Large charts, large charts show great distance, very little detail. This shows little distance, but a lot of detail. Here's Pinellas County. And all those are depth soundings. That's how we draw our coastal charts from the depth soundings. Here is Earth's magnetic field properties. That's called a compass rose. So that's how you align your ship's compass or the GPS using these codes on the nautical chart. Along the sides, you're given latitude and longitude. Remember, longitude is also akin to distance because 1 60th of a degree, which is called one minute, is the nautical mile. So you can measure how many nautical miles there are, and that's how navigation occurs. And then this, the most detail and the smallest are harbor charts. Notice, here's a contour line. Every six feet or one fathom, a contour line is drawn until you get to 30 feet, then they stop. They shade in the shallower water with blue, but once you get past that 30 feet, they stop. And that's because ships don't run that deep, so you don't have to worry about dragging ground. So they color in the shallows uh, to alert captains, hey, you're in shallow water, you're on your chart, your chart plotter, it's blue, you know, you have to check your depth. So every Six feet, a contour line is drawn, and that's just because six feet is traditional nautical measure called a fathom. That's the only reason why it's every six feet, not every 10 feet or, or what. <clears throat> and charts are taken from the mean or average low water mark. So if you have a super moon, it might be a little, little shallower, but it's rare. Uh, you don't, they're drawn from the low water mark to make it safer for navigation. 
Again, contour lines every six feet to 30, and then it stops. The compass rows uh, measures the uh, Earth's magnetic field. Magnetic north is different from geographic north. Magnetic north is, uh, and, and it changes magnetic north. So compasses change all the time. It's called the declination. You're given the correction right here in the compass rows. Magnetic, so compasses point one way, maps guide another, and there's a correction factor. If you ever take a course in navigation, you'll have to learn how to do that uh, because safe boating. Nowadays, though, you have those cool chart plotters and they have a little boat on the map and you can drive right around on your boat. Uh, but if they ever went uh, out, you know, it'd be trouble. So that's today's lesson. All right, let's uh, get back here. That's today's lesson. A little bit about navigation, cartography, and our ocean basins. Let's take a quick look at the assignments. On Wednesday, you'll have a discussion forum. Discussion forum is based on this TED Talk. This TED Talk goes through a brief history of the world from the Big Bang to present day. It's interesting. A uh, little bit preachy toward the end, but whatever, it's a TED Talk. We'll uh, watch it and take it for what it's worth. And your job is to watch this TED Talk and then describe what big history is and how we can apply it to saving our oceans in modern days from the threats that it faces knowing about our past. Uh, then, remember, when you do a uh, discussion post, you're shooting for at least one, probably two well-written paragraphs for your post, and then one well-written paragraph response to somebody else. That is due Wednesday. So that's our discussion forum. I have a few people already posted. So you can get on. I see Noah Carson posted, good job. Uh, you can get on, you can comment to them, you can do, we have one reply here. So people are working on that, and that, 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 that pleases me. The second assignment that we uh, touched upon, just to remind you, is the flow chart. Here is a sample flow chart. You can, this is just the car start. You can white it out and put your own question in there. Uh, why does ice expand when it's, cool, you know, things like that. Anything to do with water or ice. And put your background research hypothesis and how you would set up your experiment. Remember, you owe me two files. One is the flow chart for your theoretical experiment. The second is the essay. Uh, the essay is described <clears throat> in the directions. Here are our directions. Uh, so the essay is to be no more than 250 words in paragraph form, talking about the steps in the scientific method and why you did what you did. So those are due Wednesday. So that's a wrap. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Don't forget, you have your orientation material to finish up and get to me by the weekend, Sunday. And then Wednesday, module one work's done this, this week one. Our upcoming Monday, we will meet and continue with our next unit. I hope everyone has a great weekend. I will hang out for questions if anyone has any questions, but if you don't, you may sign off. Have a fantastic weekend. <clears throat> um, I am only, missing, you know, no, I, I think a guy named Luke Superset was uh, the only person who wound up missing. A couple people signed in late, and that's bad because I got to stop and track you down, and I'm not going to do it again. I'm just going to leave you as absent, but I figured I would um, be nice this time. Uh, but it's tough for me to keep track 
of everything and then take attendance in the middle of class. So once we start, it's over next time. A few people did sneak in this time and, and you've been warned. So anyone uh, named Luke, stay so I can get you present. Everyone else is marked here and have a great weekend. Thanks, I have a question if you don't mind. I certainly don't. You said you wanted us to send you an email with something about the syllabus quiz. Can you elaborate on that? I don't understand what you want me to send you. I want you to send me an email saying that you've read and agreed to the stipulations in the syllabus. Just something I type it myself, not a screenshot yep. of the actual syllabus. No, nope, something that you read it and you're just agreeing to it in case there's ever any issues. I know that you have been informed. It's kind of like the uh, HIPAA where you've been notified. Okay, th thank you. Yeah. That's it. Simple as that. May I ask, um, what, uh, there are some assignments that uh, send you mail. Um, yeah, that's exactly what uh, was just asked there. You got to send me an email agreeing to the stipulations and syllabus. Do, did I did it? Well, I don't know off the top of my head. Did you? Oh. <laughs> okay, well, then you didn't. I can find it. I, I found it. Well, I mean, you have to send an email. You have to click on email and type it to me and then click send. I can put some file. No, you just have to type me an email saying that you've read and agreed to the syllabus. Uh, but syllabus is separated file, which well, I read it. We You read it and we went through it last semester or last class. Uh, yes, uh, I signed syllabus. Right. Yes. Did you send me my email? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, it wouldn't hurt to send another one. Okay, yes, I, I will. And, uh, okay, great. And this was question for this work um, for the Wednesday, a right. and the discussion. You have your discussion forum and your flow chart and essay. Flow chart essay. And, yes. and will you check my uh, plan for flow chart essay? It's good. Well, I do what good. now? Check my flow chart well i will when you turn them in and i grade them uh, but yeah i submit but i'm not well, sure then, it's correct then oh. i'll grade them i'll grade them when when the due dates passed and everybody uh and so i sit down and grade them all okay. do you can review this no well i generally only grade assignments once when you turn them in i don't grade them and then give them back for you to redo I uh, grade them when they're due. So if you have any questions on them, you send me an email and that's good, but I'm not gonna grade them so you can redo it uh, any number of times. When you have an assignment, they're only gonna be graded uh, one time when you turn them in. Okay, uh, it's been, I can send you this, my plan sheet. Yeah, I'm not, you can ask me questions, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not comfortable with grading and then correcting and handing back and correcting and handing back. Everybody uh, turns in their work one time for a grade. No, like you can answer me like, it's okay. Oh no, it's uh, oh, not I okay. Generally, you know, I would rather you ask specific questions. Uh, and then, uh, because I'm not really gonna look over it. And then, you know what I mean? I, I generally, try to make you responsible for your work and I, I check and say okay or no do this um but I, maybe it's uh, not correct at all maybe it's not the idea what to do you ask me it's what my question because i think i'm still not understand what okay. uh, well I, go ahead and send me the email uh of it and i'll have a look at it and then give you and let you know whether you're on the right track or not yeah thank you very much thank you Professor, professor yes. I'm your senior audit, so I'm so I, how would I listen to your recorded lecture after you po po post it? Well, you go into the uh, let me go to share share screen. Let me see what I have here. Um, let's go here. 
All right. Um, do you see where, where I'm at right here, the Zoom classroom, where you come in? Yeah. You oh, see you Zoom go first, videos? You first go to table of contents, is that right? The See the and then from, from table of contents, go down right. to, to Zoom video. Right, and when you open it up, there's the orientation, and then I will put today's lesson right underneath it. Okay, because I had trouble finding the orientation, so that I could I couldn't respond. Not that it's I'm not going to get graded, but I just right. got, lost, got lost a little. Second right, question, table of contents, and then right into the classroom. And oh. those will be there in that folder. Okay, the next question, last question is, uh, how do I get to that TED lecture? How do you, where is that in this seat, sir, in this screen? Uh, okay, into our activities. Okay. Hold on, wh wh where's activities? Is where... All right, let's go back to the table of content. Yeah. Go slow, go slow. See where it says midterm module week one through eight? Open it up. Here's our weekly activities, right? When you open that up, we're in week one. Week one has the flow chart and the discussion forum. The discussion forum, when you open that up, is the TED Talk. Yeah. Now, is this being recorded as we speak? It is being recorded as we speak. Yes, sir. So I can revisit that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You certainly can. Oh, good idea. Well, that's what I'll do because uh, I. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, no problem. You have a great weekend. Pleasure yeah. having you in class. All right. Wells. Hi. I'm sorry. This is a long line. Can you hear me? Oh, I don't care. What do I got to do? Nothing. Go ahead. All right. Um, I just wanted to make sure. Do you want me to email you through my courses or at? What's through best? my courses, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because um, then it's linked right to the grade book. You get credit, boom, we're done. Sounds good. Uh, the only other thing I want to ask, well, kind of tell you is I haven't, I still haven't got my book yet. It's still on like back right? order. Is that like, when do you think we'll need our book? Oh gosh, you should have it for the first quiz, the first module quiz for sure. Um, now, are you ordering it through our college bookstore? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, you can get an electronic copy through the publisher, Pearson.com. And yeah, that's why I thought I got, I'm in the early college and they just ordered right. it for me. Okay. Yeah. So you got to wait for the bookstore. Okay. Yeah. Cause you got to spend your own money if you go the other way. Yeah. All right. Financial aid, early college has to use our bookstore. So, you know, hopefully you'll get in soon. Uh, keep uh, telling your early college people to to check into it. Just just keep on them, and and we'll hope for the best. Okay, thank you. Prof yeah, professor. One other thing in mind. I have, right, have a good old, day. I have this old book by Tom Garrison, and I try to match up the table of contents and the index to the chapter you just. Right. It's not. It's not too easy. I guess. No, I, gotta, I mean today. Well, today's lesson is not in any textbook. That's just my knowledge being passed on. Oh, maybe the, the follow-up lectures might match up to the textbook. Well, I mean, I, I studied on Garrison's textbook, uh, gosh, 35 years ago, I, I, I used Garrison's textbook when I was a grad student. So, you know. Uh, all right, well, I'll, I'll just noodle through with. Yeah, I mean, I, all I can do is say, do your best or get our, get our book, one or the other, right? Yeah, that's what I'll plan on. I'll just see how it plays out. Thank you. No problem. Have a good one. Chat room, apologize I'm late. Okay, okay. Very good. Signing off.